Hi, I'm Simeon Franklin. Today we're breaking open AngularJS. With me is Mishko. He's the founder of the AngularJS project. Thank you for having me. So Mishko, tell me a little bit about how AngularJS came to be. AngularJS came to be because, you know, I kind of got tired of building web applications. If you think about what a web application is, it's a one big marshalling problem. You know, how do you get from the database to the user and back to the database. You know, the data has to flow this particular way. Uh, and, and when you build web apps, like it's all about you know, copying data from one object to the other object and getting it through different layers and different protocols and finally showing the user where the user modifies something and the whole thing goes back. And so I wanted to kind of see if we could simplify the whole problem. And the original goal was actually slightly different than a framework. I never had the intention of building a framework. What I actually wanted to build was a way for somebody who's not a web developer rather a web designer, somebody who understands HTML but maybe not programming, mm -hmm. to be able to sprinkle a little bit of extra magic, a little bit extra attributes into um, HTML and have it persist on a server. So the idea would be that there would be a persistent cloud uh, that you can uh, acquire and then you get some kind of a key token or something that you can drop into your statically served HTML page and all of a sudden a form would come to life. And just, just by having a form and having a save button on a form, it would persist, update the URL, you can change the link, you can email it to somebody. So um, how, did you, how did you realize you had a framework on your hands? Uh, at what right. point did it become like a separate spin-off project and not a particular yeah. application? So that was my kind of what I was working on in the free time. And during the day at Google, I was working on a Google Feedback, which is an application, you might have seen it, where if you're on a Google property, you might uh, push this button that allows you to highlight the page and say this portion looks weird or something's not working, and you kind of give sure, feedback sure. To, to Google. And so we had to build an administrative UI internally to, to, to kind of manage this sea of data coming at us. And this particular uh, thing was built using traditional methods of building uh, administrative UIs. And so we were about three of us on a project and uh, six months into it, you know, so 18, 9 months. So, so, so traditionally you mean like I'll generate it on the server, HTML pushed out to the client? Uh, no, it was more of a client, so things like GUID, Clojure, et cetera. Okay, sure. Um, kind of traditional way of building single page applications. Uh, and so about three mo uh, six months into the project, which is only 18 month, men months because of three people, uh, we were getting very frustrated in terms of pr uh, productivity. You know, our, our future velocity just wasn't there. And so we were wondering, you know, what could we try differently? And so in my frustration, I kind of made the claim, you know, with this project I'm working on a site, I could have this thing done in two weeks. And, uh, you know, they called me on it. It was a bluff, and they called me on it, and they said, well, if you think you can do that, go ahead, show us, prove us wrong. And so it took, uh, took me uh, three weeks, not two weeks, so I failed a two weeks test. Um, but three weeks later, we basically had a rewritten. And what was interesting about the rewrite using the, the, the Angular was that we went from 17,000 lines of code down to 1,000 lines of JavaScript uh, for the same uh, application, same behavior. So, so people basically started to pay attention and say, hey, you know, this is a fraction amount of code that you're talking about here and it was written in a fraction amount of time how can that be and so ever since then you know the feature velocity was awesome uh, and people just enjoyed building things with angular and this is where kind of it slowly turned from me building a product to me just maintaining it as a framework. Yeah, so, so what was the it. status of Angular at that point? It was a side, side project, was it already an open source? It was an source? open source project at that point already. Uh, it was a side project that I started in my free time uh, but it basically slowly became Google sponsored because I was working at Google and sure. it became my full time job to just kind of work on this and support all the other projects at Google using it. So, working on Angular is like part of your day job at Google now? So, right now there is uh, about uh, almost 10 people working on it full time. Ah, okay. Uh, so, it's a, quite a lot of people. Uh, not all of them are self are they? Yeah, are they, are they Googlers? Are they all doing, are they uh, writing code? Most of them are Googlers. We have few. Um, interns and contractors who are eventually going to hopefully become Googlers. Uh, so they're working on it, but you know, a couple of people working on documentation and things of that sort. Sure. Uh, but about, I think about five core engineers who are working on this. This is a full-time job, nothing else. So the people who are, who are external to Google um, are participating in a more minor role. Most of the people who are like involved in a real active way in terms of writing code are all kind of internal to Google. Uh, most of them are internal. The, the people who are external, uh, they tended to be uh, people who were active in the community in the past, and we just thought that they were doing such a good job that yeah. we said, you know, you're doing all this great work for free. Maybe we can just kind of pay you a little bit to kind of just say thank you for the cool. Yeah, I'm, so I'm curious working. about the the community around Angular. 
So if you're the founder, did you deliberately set about building a community, or did people just kind of discover you and, uh, and pitch in? Uh, we were trying to build a community. Uh, there was a guy who we hired early on, Igor Minar, who helped tremendously with uh, building it up. Um, and so we were actively kind of working on building it up and, and getting it going. And, and what, does that, what does that mean? I mean uh, like setting up a mailing list, list answering questions, sure. you know, going to conferences, talking about it, you know, showing the value of it, which actually is quite tricky when we talk about it later because it's fundamentally a different way of looking at building mm -hmm. web applications. But at some point, it turns out that there are people from the community themselves who kind of stepped up and they just started answering the questions. And so over time, there was less and less of a role for us to kind of manage it. It became kind of a self-managed community thing, which is awesome. Like, I, I can't imagine. I was going to say, that's, that's the measure of success, right? Yeah. You're not having to push it anymore. There's, there's people who just take the ball and, and run with it. Talk about, talk about Google's participation in Angular a little bit. Um, is, th is that important to it as an open source project? Is it important that it, it has you know, Google's, Google's backing? How, how big of a role does that? Does that play um, in, in Angular's usage? You know, it's a very good question because I've seen a lot of people saying, oh, look, it's the Google's project. But if you really think uh -huh. about it, it didn't really, it wasn't like a Google initiative or anything like right. that. It kind of just so happens that I work at Google and therefore Google is kind of sponsoring it. Uh, but it was really an open source thing that I started on the side in an independent fashion. Uh, so it wasn't per se Google in, in that sense. But you know, because we work at Google, we get to um, take advantage of a couple of awesome things about it. So you know, Google uh, is is active in um, pushing the, the browsers into mm -hmm. new limits, uh, what you can do in the browser. So there's standards, and so things like web components, uh, things like object observe, uh, model driven views, they, all of these things, uh, you know, are kind of outgrowth uh, of either of directly of Angular or are heavily influenced by the learnings of Angular. Uh, and so we get to push these into, into standards. And once the standards come in to be, uh, you know, Angular can be better or you know, you know, more, a lot of more of what Angular is can be pushed into the browser. So hopefully the future of building uh, web applications is going to be more declarative. Which and I, I, totally, I totally want to come back to that point. Mm -hmm. I wondered about that. You know, as, a, uh, as a JavaScript framework maker who also works for a company that makes mm -hmm. a browser, if you, uh, if you have any unique insight or maybe even uh, unique leverage in, in the direction of web apps. Um, um, are, are going? Not sure I have any unique leverage, uh, but, uh, or, or, or insight for that matter. Uh, but you know, it, there is an advantage that there's a lot of people uh, who work on these things and whose day-to-day -day job is to kind of figure out how to make the browser better and who are connected in the, in the standards community. And you know, we talk to uh, Firefox, Microsoft, and all sure. the, uh, uh, I mean the WebKit um, to kind of bring this to be. Um, and so, once the, we have an idea in, in Angular and say, hey, you know, it, it turns out that this particular paradigm works really well, uh, we can go to the, the, the team within who, work on, who works on the, um, the open source standard and, and they can take it to the next level and uh, bring it to the other uh, browser makers and things get built and incorporated. Are you making a tool that Google uses internally? I mean, I, I kind of have this mental model of a, you know, you guys and the dark guys all, all lobbying the Gmail team to you know, use my product or something. It, uh -huh. d does Google use Angular internally? It does, but you know what? It's a very interesting thing because Angular started externally. So in a strange way, um, people at Google who use Angular use it because of the open source community. Sure. Uh, so we were open first before we were actually uh, inside Google. Um, and um, you know, because of the strong outside community and strong uh, answers base and, and the usage and the pickup, it almost makes it easier to for Googlers to go to their uh, team and say, "Look at this new unique thing, which happens to be built by a Googler uh, that you get to use on our product as well." Uh, and so, because of the open source community, actually a lot of new projects are getting started within uh, Google that actually use this. And we have a couple of big ones. Uh, the, the most notable one, which is already public, is the Double Click for Advertisers, which is more of a uh, it's not an end product, so most people are not familiar with it but advertisers are familiar with it. And the other one is the link back YouTube interface, which is actually available on a couple of embedded devices, like for example, um, the, um, the gaming console, it's kind of escaping me, the mm -hmm. Sony gaming console, whatever that's called, Sure. PlayStation. I wonder, just in terms of the community, I mean, one, one uh, marker of the size, I guess, is the number of contributors and the volume of the mm -hmm. mailing list and that kind of thing. But what about like usage statistics? Do you know like how many projects are using Angular or, or you mentioned yeah. a, couple of, a couple of large use cases, do you have any? Yeah, off the top of my head, I don't like know, and it, I don't think we actually track it because you know how does one track how many sites use you? Um, so, so I, I don't actually have the, the numbers. It's the numbers that I would like to get my hands on, but I just don't have them. 
Um, but I can tell by the community in terms of the search queries on, on mm -hmm. Google uh, or on search engines, uh, also the, the amount of traffic on the mailing list, the um, stock overflow traffic, uh, the, the Twitter traffic, et cetera. We can kind of judge as to our usages, and, and it seems to be uh, pretty popular, so we're very happy about that. Well, and there seems to be um, an emerging buzz about not just Angular, but you know, there's you've got some competitors that are essentially in the same space. And I don't know mm -hmm. what to a uh, MVC client frameworks. I mean, what should we call the the Ember knockout? Backbone? Yeah, they're all frameworks. So, the, so you have uh, so the biggest one are you know, Angular, Ember, uh, knockout. I don't think I'm missing anything. There's Backbone, but it's I really a little less, it's maybe. a little lower level. So yeah. I don't think I want to include it in the framework category in, in that sense. It's, it's a lot more low level. I think of it more as an assembly. I mean, it's, it's four kilobytes, right? Like it's, it's a different. Sure. Not that the size defines how good you are, but it's a smaller thing, and it, it has got different goals. But it, within those frameworks, uh, that's kind of what, what I consider the, the class. And you know, because we're pushing so much of these into standards, like we're uh, are actually interested in making sure that other people can build other frameworks mm -hmm. uh, and can benefit from this thing. So, so for example, Object Observe, if it goes into the browser, uh, then other frameworks get Helps to be able the, to, exactly, sure. everybody gets help. The other thing is um, DOM mutation observation. It also helps other frameworks as well. And so the idea would be that you could build a, a site so that you could say, oh, you know, I'm going to use Angular for, Angular for my, uh, maybe for my controllers, but I will use this particular widget, which is done, you know, graphing widget library, but that happens to be built using Ember, and they should be able to mm. live together one-on-one uh, -on -one and cooper uh, cooperate and, and, and work with that because right now it's not quite possible. They're totally different beasts. Yeah. It's totally different beasts and not possible. And, and I think what's needed is some of these underlying primitives to be incorporated into the browser so that the way object observation is performed and the way uh, DOM mutation is performed is consistent between the frameworks. And then the objects and the DOM become the communication channel for these components and then it simply makes no difference in terms of what each component happens to be implemented in, and then everybody can coexist and, and builds a better, kind of a more open uh, community, right? Yeah, because because the the ideas are sort of the same. I mean, the the simplest I idea that the uh, the HTML should automatically update based on JavaScript objects. I mean, the the core idea, a lot of the frameworks are the same, but how they're actually implemented is is drastically yes. different. Do you guys, do you um I mean. Do you pay attention to how Ember does stuff? Do you do you pay attention to their design philosophies? Have you learned I anything from the other projects? I, unfortunately, I have never used Ember or Knockout or any of those things, yeah. and so it's hard for me to to judge or or, or anything like that. Uh, I, I'm just a strong believer that in an open source world, uh, there's this healthy um, everybody gets to do, and then the ideas win. Uh, totally, and, 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 and everybody wins as a group, you know, rather than one versus the other. So I'm all for having a lot of different frameworks cooperating together and, and building different things. And this is why I think the primitives are important for that particular point. The, the thing that's unique about Angular uh, from all of the other frameworks is that we do dirty watching versus everybody else basically wraps your object and sign a kind of a special model thing. So you either have to inherit from an object or you have to spe use special getters or setter methods right. or, or something like that. Um, and I think that goes back to our core philosophy, which is that we want to have essentially zero boilerplate. Like I'm very uh, insistent on the simple thing is that I should just be able to say what I mean. And it's the framework's job to do the heavy lifting, right? And so it, when you force people to, or developers to wrap things into these special objects, all of a sudden it's not the simple thing. All of a sudden it's like, well, you got to understand the mm -hmm, life cycle mm -hmm. of this. And it's it just a different beast all of a sudden. And so this is why I want to keep it simple. So I can see um, cooperating with the other frameworks, um, and in some ways, like the the changes that are happening in the browser, maybe justify some of your design decisions. Um, but they benefit all the other frameworks as well. Yes. But what about um, you know, what about somebody like Dart? I mean, that's another Google-funded project that, in some ways, is really similar, like declarative HTML and get you know data from from your code automatically into the browser. Um, how do you how do you relate to those guys? Do you see them as a competitor? Do you see like Google having to pick between them? You know, what's your relationship to the Dart, no, Dart project? No, I think I actually look at it slightly differently. So first of all, Angular is a philosophy of building the web application. You know, the fact that we have declarative, the fact that we allow you to extend the HTML vocabulary. Mm -hmm. um, and, and to us, that's a philosophy, right? That's not a specific language. And so we work with JavaScript, CoffeeScript, 
TypeScript mm -hmm. or you know what have you, what else that, that comes along the way. Um, Dart is slightly different because they have a, it's a kind of fundamentally different VM. It doesn't compile right. down to JavaScript. Uh, but we're looking into incorporating them as well because we really want to focus on the philosophy rather than on the implementation details of a language you happen to choose. Um, so that's, that's kind of where we're going. And if, if these philosophies of building an application like declarative mode ends up in, built into the browser, then Dart gets it automatically, right? So sure. in, in some ways, you can think of Angular as the, the test bed of crazy ideas, right? We, we throw all these ideas in there and see what sticks, and the stuff that is really working well, we then pick and choose and go to the standards body and say, hey, you know, you guys should consider about um, incorporating this in the browser because it would help everybody. So is that process like underway are there specific specs that you guys are pushing um, besides just some of the like observing the DOM for instance like what would you like to see the browser do that makes it easier for JavaScript frameworks um, so I think all of these things that we're already talking about are already underway so observing the, the object heap which is object observe that's already underway uh, and I think it's already implemented in well I can't I, I know many of the um, browser vendors came on board and said they will implement I just don't remember who already has done it uh, the other one is the object mutation observation, sorry, the, the DOM mutation observation, mm -hmm. which is being able to know when, when a DOM something's changed in the DOM tree. has changed. And there has been the synchronous version of this particular thing already implemented, and it's kind of being deprecated because the synchronous has implications in terms of performance, which right. the browser vendors don't like for obvious reasons. Uh, and so the, so the new one is essentially the same idea, but in this time it's asynchronous, and because it's asynchronous, things can be batched together and things can be mm. a lot faster. So we we think that all these primitives of watching the DOM, watching the objects, uh, and also packaging your components into reusable declarative things like web components, it's already underway. And so it's just a matter of time before, uh, before it comes to the masses. And so, so to, to me, this is basically how future in the future we will be building web applications. And, and the web component thing gets more to the HTML side of things, right? I mean, I, I think um, one of the talks I watched, maybe you said like Angular is, is HTML the way it, it should have been if the browser makers were thinking about, about applications. Um, so is that like browser support for the, the concept of a template? Uh, that, that's one of the things, yes, uh, template. But um, if, you, if you step back, like browsers are really awesome at rendering static documents, right? They mm -hmm. have a lot of things. There's a lot of it is declarative. You can say, I want to center something, and it is so. Right? It should be red, bl you know, blinking, whatever. Sure. It just magically happens. But when it comes to uh, imperative behavior, right? So declaratively, we can statically describe the document. Awesome. Imperatively, not so much. It's this complicated set of like, well, there's this events that happen and these callbacks, and you have to know how internally it works. And so there is a lot of abstractions that can be had and, and simplifying it. So for example, things like simply just ng controller, just the simple concept that there's a behavior waiting behind a piece of DOM that you can call, and then having the methods be scoped to the controller rather than the global window object. You know, minor things like that turns out to go a long way to just encapsulating the, the logic and being able to, uh, to, to help the developer in kind of thinking about the problem. And, and here, uh, like, I, I come to this as, uh, as an educator. I mean, what I do is, is teach, and that frequently means the first thing I have to do is be a student and you know, figure out new technologies and, and play with them and see if I can understand them myself. And um, messing with the, these like MVC client frameworks, um, you know, learning jQuery was just like learning an API for stuff mm -hmm. I knew how to do already, right? Yes. You're already doing DOM manipulation, mm -hmm. selection, and events and stuff. And I get into uh, Angular, and there's so many more concepts. And I'm mm -hmm. okay with, you know, model view controller, but then there's filters and services. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm directives and transclusions and uh, do you consciously think about um, you know easing the the learning curve mm -hmm. for the beginner mm -hmm. if, it, if it's HTML the, the way it's supposed to be is there a, is there a hello world of angular that's mm -hmm. that's really simple and doesn't pull all these concepts in uh, you yes. know, how do you uh, and, and is that a like next necessary complexity is there a way um, away from it we try a lot to simplify things as much as we do I mean we have endless discussions you know yeah. uh, team members you know how do we make it as simple as possible and yet be able to be express all those powerful concepts. Powerful as, as necessary. Uh, and at some point, uh, you know, you have to just invent new concepts like scopes, et cetera, to kind of describe this particular thing. Uh, and, and part of it is that if you, even if you look at HTML or CSS, like there's a lot of concepts in there that people had to learn. It just so happens that they internalized them and we, and we learned of, it a decade ago, so now yes, it doesn't seem complicated. It, it doesn't seem complicated any, anymore. 
So it's the same thing with, with Angular. It's just a new concept to learn because it's a fundamentally different way of doing things. But I want to make a distinction between libraries like jQuery and frameworks like Angular or Ember or, or Backbone, uh, sorry, uh, Knockout. Sure. Which is that, um, you, you know, in the framework world, the framework is in charge. And it calls you when it sees necessary, right? And so you have to implement these hooks that, by which you get called at the right point. In libraries, the, the world is the, right, the other way around, which is that you're in full control and you get to call the library whenever you feel like. Mm -hmm. And because in the framework the, it's the other way around, uh, the framework gets to have opinions and it has to get to share these opinions with you and so you kind of have to play along with the opinions the framework has. And, and this is the simple trade-off that you happen to have, which is that you can be more general but do less or you can do a lot more but you have to say, okay. Be more opinionated. Be more opinionated. You have to do it this particular way in order to play with our philosophy that we happen to have. Sure. So that's just simply trading off between frameworks and libraries that just exist for anything like that. And at least some of uh, you know, explaining your opinions boils down to documentation. And I, I hear people complain about, and I, and I think it may be like inherent to the problem space, but like about all the frameworks, you know. Yes. Uh, the, the documentation is too confusing or too complicated or, you know. Yes. Is, is, that, is that something you personally work on? Who writes the docs? Um, so, yes, I, I personally wrote many of the docs, but the rest of the team writes a lot of the docs as well. Um, it is something that we struggle with because, you know, we're engineers. We're not right. that good at writing the, the stuff. Uh, and we are aware of, of this, that, that documentation is kind of the, the weak point in, in the chain over here. And so we are working actively on, on improving it. So we, for example, just recently added a button on, a, on, a, on each page where you can click. And it says, you know, you want to improve this doc? Click here. And it takes you directly to the GitHub I saw that. page where you can go and edit whatever you want and hit submit button. And then we get to review it and say, yeah, sounds good. And we can approve it. And it actually turns out that a lot of things, a lot of minor low-hanging fruits were fixed in this particular way. Uh, and, and so this is just an example of, of how yeah. we wanted to do this. But also we have, uh, we're finding people in the community who are just passionate about this and who are good at uh, teaching others. Uh, and we're having them write blogs and also having them uh, update the documentation as well. So this is something that we're, it's a constant struggle, you know, that I think every framework has to go with. Absolutely. Uh, if anything, you know, Angular has a bit of a harder job because it strays further from the, the mainstream, right? Uh, you know, it has crazy concepts like, okay, you get to invent your own HTML. Like, mm -hmm. I, I don't think most other frameworks have this concept, but most other frameworks basically said, this is the vocabulary that you can put in HTML and it's fixed. Sure. Uh, Angular, you can say, well, make up your own. And so there's a whole set of complexity around that. Uh, Angular has dependency injection. Again, most frameworks don't say anything about that. Um, and so these higher level concepts are powerful, but they also have to be explained. And so it's a trade-off. And it, it seemed like um, just kind of reading through your documentation, getting a feel for the for the project philosophy. Um, some of the some of the complexity, or maybe just some of the concepts, come from your your background, your interest in uh, a testing approach. Mm -hmm. Are you is that is that your job at, at Google? I saw like you described as an agility coach or something. It at was. Some point. I just never changed the description. <laughs> never changed the description. <laughs> all right. Uh, but you're but you're really interested in in testing, and I mean the dependency injection at least comes partly yes. from that point of view, and there's like a testing framework built into Angular? Uh, we, we have a separate project that for testing purposes, yes. Yeah. So, so there's a lot of, so, so testing is a, is a big thing, because I'm a big fan of test-driven development. Yeah. Um, and um, so a lot of decisions actually in the framework were heavily influenced by, you know, how easy it will be to test. And so, so if you had a, if you're, imagine yourself, you're on a path of building something, you have a choice to make. Uh, we almost always side with the with this choice of testability, and it and it really shows. I mean, in product, you know, we ha come bundled with mocks. You can test our um, controllers without the UI. Uh, we have an end-to-end -end test runner. Uh, we have just basically the whole nine yards to make sure that you just and, don't and have And all an that's excuse. not just to test your code, the framework, but to test my yes, code, the application, yes. right? Using Thank your you framework. Thank you for pointing that out. You know, a lot of frameworks have internal tests, but then they're like, oh, you want to write your own application and you figure it out. You figured it out. And, sure. And so that I feel like this part of the opinions. And, and I think one of the things I would like to try try to do with the open source community is to kind of change the the the, the, the way the, the community operates and say, you know, if you're gonna build a framework, I fully support that and I think it's an awesome way to innovate. Mm -hmm. But one of the things you should do is also think about the people on uh, the developers and how they're gonna test this. So it is your job not only to make life easier of others, but also to share you know, this is based maybe the best practice in testing my stuff. So if you're going to build an app using my awesome library framework or whatever, 
Well, let me show you how the testing happens as well. What it looks like and what the developer right. workflow ought to look like exactly. as you build it. Interesting. So, so um, where do you see Angular going? I mean, like, what's the future? I almost get the sense that you, you almost wish it could go away. Like, the browser could implement enough stuff that this would just be the way people do, do apps and you wouldn't. So that's a very good question. A lot of people ask, you know, will eventually Angular go away if browsers incorporate all these things? And uh, it's kind of funny because for a while I kind of operated under the assumption that, yes, Angular is just a very fancy shiv that eventually will disappear. But it turns out it won't because um, Angular has many opinions that the browser vendors are simply uncomfortable for a very good reason because, you know, they're building a general platform that has to be as good for, for a CRUD application as it is for building, um, what is the game where there's birds fly over? Angry, angry Birds. Angry Birds, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So you want to make sure that you can build a game as well as a, a CRUD application in there. Uh, and so the goals of the browser vendors is to support the widest possible use case. And so when you come to things like very strong opinions about, well, this is how the application is assembled, uh, it turns out that the browser vendors aren't interested in these things because, well, to some degree it is an opinion and they shouldn't be because, well, if you choose this, then you are doing it at the expense of this other thing. And so what the browser vendors rightfully do is they look for the core primitives. You know, what are the primitives that we can do that will make building these kinds of frameworks and libraries uh, successful? And if you look at, uh, I think a good example of this is Node.js. Uh, Node.js, at uh, its core, it has essentially nothing. And it basically says, look, you're the community. Uh, you figure out what the best way of serving files is, sure. and et cetera. And so then you have wonderful frameworks like Express that come out of it. And, the package management system, et cetera. You just needed a fast enough exactly. JavaScript engine to enable that sort of ecosystem. Exactly. And so I, I feel the same way about um, the Angular and the browser and the frameworks in general, which is that I, I think browser's job is to just enable these ideas, and then it should be the frameworks uh, that, that try to uh, experiment with these ideas mm -hmm. and see if these ideas indeed are something that the community wants um, or if, if it's something that's useful, right? And then you know, through natural process of trying different things, you know, these better ideas percolate to the top and other frameworks implement it or and then they grow this way. And, and I can see that from the, uh, from the browser maker's perspective, you know, you, you have to have, you know, old, support old style web applications. Exactly. But from Once you a, put an API in there, you just can't take it from out. From a web developer's perspective, like, is there still a place for me to write, you know, old server generated HTML pushed out to the client static style web applications? When do I know that I need you know, something like something like an Angular. What's the what's like the break-even point where the right. the additional complexity makes sense? Uh, so I like to argue that it's actually simpler to build a Angular app than it is a server-side app. But there's places where server-side apps are important. So uh, uh, the biggest one is crawlers, right? Web crawlers. So if you want to be have your uh, site indexable by a search engine, um, you know, search engines today don't support uh, JavaScript. Now, I'm hoping that that's going to change in the future, uh, but as it is stands right now, that's just simply not the case. Yeah, and that's and totally, a, I mean, in some ways, it's almost like the some of the projects Google is supporting work against their own best interest in terms of, of uh, making it easy for them to index all the content on the web if all the content does live in JavaScript, you know. Does, does Angular um, help me to make a site that's both dynamic and indexable? Is there any specific thought about um, we were kind of experimenting with the, having this idea of a server-side pre-rendered content. Okay. Um, the idea would be that the server could generate the content so that the crawler can come along and see it, but at the same time, Angular can, can connect to it once it's generated. So you could run like um, server-side Angular? It's kind of like to kind of get it going, yeah. and then once it's delivered to the browser, the browser can attach uh, behavior to it, and uh, it could become a dynamic single-payer application. Interesting. Uh, but it, it gets complicated very quickly. So I don't know if it's a general purpose system that can be built out of it. And, and is, I mean, you said you see it as easier to write the, the dynamic application with Angular than server side. So do you see everybody moving, moving in that direction? And if that's the case, are, you know, are, are there going to be emerging standards for, for people like Google to still be able to, to find the content and have like a, a right. particular URL for a particular location. So there is already a good emerging stuff. standard uh, where if you have an Ajax application, there's a special URL that the uh, crawl engines, uh, search engines, the crawlers can the go to. The pound bang. And, yeah, the pound bang thing. Um, yeah. And then what you can do, what I've seen other people do, for, ex uh, for example, I believe HBO started with this, is they actually run their sites through um, the headless browser. Can't think of the name right now. Wow. Anyways, they generate the HTML, 
they cache the HTML and they serve it up to the crawlers. So the crawlers basically see the static content, but if, uh, if a regular browser comes in, then they get to have the banana content. And the generation is done in an automated fashion so that you know, it, it's not an extra burden it's for the developers. Which feels cool, but also somewhat perverse. You know, it is. It you is gotta, perverse, you got to right? run, run the whole site through a client. In order exactly. To ever, yeah. So if you think about it, I think what a long-term uh, unavoidable thing for the, uh, for the crawlers is that the crawlers will become a lot more like browsers where they uh, will have, start, have to start executing the JavaScript uh, and, and see what the rendered page looks like. Wow. From that perspective, then actually, you could be, you could be working in Google's best interest, right? They've got the smartest engineers who are going to be able to have the uh, the crawler that best emulates a browser, and lots of browser engineers. Uh, man, the search engine of the future is going to be more complicated. Mm -hmm. um, so specifically, in terms of, of Angular's future, so you don't see it going away. You don't, you don't see all of its functionality just kind of provided by the browser. Well, it, it, it provides things like dependency injection, which is unlikely to be browser. Right. Uh, it provides things like. Um, filters uh, to filter the expressions, uh, testing philosophy, and all of these things, uh, mocks, et cetera, uh, all these things are things that will be opinions, and it's unlikely to. And you're only interested in moving like, kind of the general philosophical components that make it easy to write the frameworks into the browser, and not you don't see like a you know, Chrome Angular plugin or, or right. built into Chrome Angular implementation or anything like right. that. Right. What I'm interested in is that uh, if I want to build a web app, and I see a cool component that does charting, and it's done in Angular, and I see this other thing that does an awesome bar chart or pie chart or, or like say, calendar to be able widget. To talk together on the they same page. They need to be able to talk to each other. Sure. Uh, without, uh, there has to be a hard choice that the developer has to make. Oh, I have to use this framework, or I get, don't get to use all these widgets or something like that. Like it should just be, you know, very, you know, everybody just loves each other and plays together. <laughs> Absolutely, that's a. That's a wonderful future to look forward to. I, I hope it comes true. Hey, um, thank you for coming in to talk to thank us. Thank you for having me. Google I.O. is coming up. It's a busy time probably, and hopefully we'll get, to, we'll get to see you there and hang out a little bit more.